My name's Jeff Freed. You saw me on stage with the uh, Joe and Jeff show at the end of this morning. And this is a session about where we're going with IRIS. Uh, it's pretty quick pace. I'm covering a lot of ground. So first, how many people feel like they're familiar with what is an IRIS, what's sort of in it? All right. So if, if you did not raise your hand, I apologize because I won't go into a lot of depth, but I'll try to try, try to show things. You know, essentially, Iris is a platform. Which, how many folks are using Cache? How many are using Ensemble? Right. I will say Iris inherited everything from Cache and Ensemble. It's very familiar. The lion's share of it is very robust software. It is the same. But we've added a lot of new capabilities, and IRIS is the future moving forward where InterSystems is investing in new capabilities, new facilities. It is still the same integration engine, the same that, that you know from Ensemble, where we're changing names to confuse the innocent. Uh, and adding capabilities. The underlying data store still has tons of mileage on it, and we're getting robustness from that, but we've already done a fair amount of upgrading in that area. And open analytics I'll talk more about. How many people are using Deep C? Okay. How about I know? Okay, so these will be familiar uh, because those capabilities were brought forward into InterSystems Iris, but they're no longer separate modules and separate pieces. Uh, overall, you heard a lot about these themes this morning, and the way I will be going through the roadmap for Iris is by audience because there's a lot of different subsystems within InterSystems Iris, a lot of potential applications. That's the nature of a broad platform. But I'll, I'll really start with what are we doing for developers? Where are we going? And then similarly for operations, and similarly for interoperability and analytics. And some of the facilities that we'll be talking about obviously apply to multiple Audiences. If you're a developer, you care about cloud-based deployment and DevOps. If you're an operations manager, you do as well. If you are involved in interoperability or operations or development, you probably care about API management. So these trends will, uh, I'm trying not to repeat myself a lot across these, but uh, let's get into really audience by audience what the roadmap is for InterSystems Iris, starting with developers, where um, there is a lot of new trends for developers and a lot of new technologies out there. You heard Terry talking about freedom of choice, which is essentially InterSystems' commitment to providing building blocks, multiple languages, uh, and modular development. In addition to, and you'll hear us talking about uh, server-side and client-side languages. That might be confusing, but effectively, the native built-in languages, which are object script and SQL, are actually executed in the same kernel as the rest of InterSystems Iris. Java and C Sharp, and we are just adding or re-adding Python and Node support, are running in another kernel. You could put them on the same machine, and what we have been really focused on from a performance standpoint is if you want high performance, you can get shared memory facilities from any client-side language. Uh, but and we're building out REST APIs so that any language of your choice you can use. 
We touched this morning about machine learning. There's a lot of hype around that, but I'll show you more about what we're doing there. And uh, the way I'd characterize that is we're getting out of the way because, and making it so you can use whatever ML stack you like. And then there's a lot of work and investment in cloud-oriented development. So the way that uh, I laid this out is essentially today are things that are currently shipping, currently available to you in any instance of InterSystems Iris this year uh, means you know from now to the next year, but most of the things are really in our upcoming 2018 to 2019 one releases, pretty front loaded. And beyond is beyond. Right? So general time frames, uh, I'm happy to take more, more questions, obviously, as we go. So on server side tools, and new SQL features, there are a couple of sessions here, and there's a couple of, uh, I'll say, minor tool enhancements in the current uh, inner systems studio and atelier. But there's also a fair number of pretty exciting partner capabilities in that area and things that we're putting into the open exchange, such as unit testing, mocking, uh, a visual code-based IDE. For languages by, the way I, uh, we think about this is, what language are you writing in, what computer language, and what models do you want to access? Obviously, in most client-side languages, uh, the first place to start is relational, but we have an object-oriented database, so we're exposing objects in the native form of that language and globals are one of the uniquenesses, the ability to design your own data structure. How many people use globals, have built your own global stuff? Everybody here, pretty much. So what, what you will see are things that we call native APIs. Again, that is a access directly from a client-side language to globals. So you can manipulate globals that you might have in legacy code you can access things that are running elsewhere in the system, or you can write your own globals from Java or from Python. Beyond that, as we build out additional data model support, because what we're finding is a lot of uh, interest in multi-model databases, we'll build those into language support as well. And then from the standpoint of API-based development, I talked this morning about API management. There's two, did anyone go to the API REST session earlier in this room? I understand it was totally sold out and booked as a repeat tomorrow. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that because there's two aspects of API development. And then in this area, obviously, I we're expecting this to be a very quick moving space. So that's almost a placeholder in terms of what are additional API management or microservices standards that we want to support. So that's a very high level today, tomorrow, beyond. In cloud-oriented development, I think you'll hear us say contain, container, container, container. We're all in on containers. We're not abandoning traditional installables. And many customers have their own installers, aren't able to use containers today, and we understand that. But who has used containers in the audience? Not bad, not bad. And as Carlos mentioned, we have introduced a community edition, which is a free developer license in a container. That's for expedience for quick distribution, you may use it for training. It, you may still find you want uh, a traditional developer license for load testing, for testing some of the sharding or ECP features which aren't in this community edition. But these are going to be in all the cloud marketplaces by the end of the year, 
so that it's really easy for people to access. Now, API management is a very big space. And there are two parts of our API management strategy. The first is to make generating code from a Swagger spec in object script easy. And you probably heard about that in the session earlier. Because if you are working uh, in server-side code and generating APIs, that's a, we have a unique language. We need unique tooling for that. The other aspect are a pretty broad set of facilities. Once you're working with APIs, um, access control is permissions of who can use what APIs. This protection is both intrusion protection and uh, networking-oriented protection and security. Um, the creation and design with new versionings and managing versionings essentially is a situation where you may start with a spec, create code from that, update the spec that's a new version of the API, and now you have two versions which you can run simultaneously and swap clients back and forth and control in, in, in versioning from source code control. Uh, and then if you are building a SaaS service, you may decide that you want to charge, for example, by data dip. Those, we have some customers that are using uh, NLP features and are really interested in offering that on a per API basis. So that's a very quick view of API management. And I'll say, you know, watch this space because we'll have more published on this in, in a few weeks uh, and things you can try on a preview basis in October. Who's uh, working with any machine learning stacks, Keras or TensorFlow in the audience? Anybody a little bit of playing around? So this is a very quick moving space. And our focus, at least for the near term at InterSystems, is to give you the choice of whatever stack you, you want to use. We are not going to invent a new machine learning algorithm. What we will do is make it so your data is easy to prepare. Data wrangling is a lot of the work in any machine learning project. And that it is exposed securely and quickly to people who are working in a machine learning environment. So we have a bunch of customers that have this situation where the data scientists are just like, oh, just give me the data. And IT is like, this is six petabytes of highly secure data with private information in it. No way. And therefore, they don't do any data science. The scenario here is that you can, as IT, provide a view that is a public view or a, you know, if you will, a compliant view for data scientists to work with without giving them the keys to the kingdom. And then whatever element you want to work with, we've standardized on Spark. And the most prevalent stacks on Spark tend to be TensorFlow, which is a deep learning library, and Keras, uh, but R, Python, any language you want. So that's all I was going to say about developers at this session. That gives you a sense of the, the pace here. I'm going to switch and talk to, what about the operations experience? Um, here, the focus is to be easy to deploy and easy to manage. Uh, and I mentioned that containers are a big focus of this. With containers, there are things called orchestrators that allow you to have multiple containers in one system. For that, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And obviously, being rock solid in security and then elastic growth are, are the main focus points. 
what that looks like from a roadmap standpoint, from a, a robustness standpoint, uh, I think all of these things are familiar to you because they are pretty much identical in Iris ver versus Cache. Uh, we have improved some of the mirroring models and operations, but uh, feedback that, that I've heard has been pretty good marks on terms of robustness and operations for mission critical operations. I'd love to hear more. If, if, if that's not true in your case, I want to hear about it. Um, this year, we're focused specifically on horizontal scalability and making that elastic growth work both on the cloud and on-prem. I'll talk a little bit more about that, as well as what are called multi-zone, multi-cloud availability. Multi-zone might be that you have things in Germany and in the US because you need for GDPR to have specific data residency in Germany. It might be that you want to have a DR facility in a different region in case something really bad happens in the region you're in. And multi-cloud similarly is working with your own data, it's any hybrid kind of configuration. Um, and beyond that, we see both opportunities to really lock down the kernel for highly hardened environments and an increasing number of customers that are running, I'll say, distributed systems that are loosely coupled, where synchronizing them through metadata and foreign keys is a, is a pattern that we're looking at. So that's the sort of security and robustness direction. From a provisioning standpoint, you'll hear, there's a lot of sessions here about the InterSystems Cloud Manager. Uh, and one thing I wanted to uh, state or clarify if it wasn't already clear, there, the, there are a number of container orchestrators on the market. The most popular one is called Kubernetes, which is spelled with a K. If you haven't heard of it, take a look at it. Our plan is to be all in on Kubernetes the way we're all in on Docker by the end of this year. We also have our own orchestrator called the InterSystems Cloud Manager, which we will support and grow for people that don't have an orchestrator or don't want to learn Kubernetes, or Kubernetes only works with containers. So much like you'll see in this sort of native plus open strategy, as we work faster and faster in a cloud world, we know that we, we expect that we'll be integrating with a lot of tools and especially DevOps pipelines that are not things we build as inner systems. And the, the top one of those is in container orchestration with Kubernetes. The same thing for consolidated management and monitoring. Right? To manage a cluster of multiple Iris instances is today harder than we want it to be by a long shot. And uh, this is an area in particular where I'd love to have meetings or feedback from anybody in the room because this is an initiative that we're starting to simplify and be modern in the way we manage and monitor intersystems technology. Uh, and then XAAS is for PICX. Right, you heard HealthShare as a service and Connections as a service this morning. Database as a service, uh, connectivity as a service, et cetera. Uh, there's no, nothing to disclose here other than we'll be doing a lot more in this space. So I see head nods, that's all good. Let me go a little bit deeper into elastic growth. And there's a session specifically about scaling out that I'd refer if you're interested in sharding or, or elasticity. We, we uh, introduced 
starting with the first version of Iris. And one thing that we discovered is it was very flexible, but probably too complicated for people to provision and understand. So what we've done in the, um, what we're just about finished with in our 2019 one release is a much simpler architecture where you're just thinking about nodes and as add, adding additional nodes as you grow, go, grow as you go with rebalancing so that if you have data growth, you don't need to worry about it. And you're not thinking about multiple different kinds of roles inside the architecture. You're just saying, I need another one. Under the hood, we'll provision the services that are necessary to do load distribution and fault tolerance. And there's a, a variety of reference patterns specifically for that. I've already talked this morning about working in the cloud and providing things in the top cloud marketplaces as single instances and containers. And they're there today with bring your own license and shortly were these, were these community licenses. But if you wanna run in production in the cloud, we expect that you'll need reference architectures and tools because that'll be more than one container. It'll be fault tolerant with backup patterns. Uh, we have reference architectures today where Google is the most recently published one and those will keep up on a regular basis and would love feedback. Because the intent here is that as an operations person, you don't have to make up these patterns. We give you recipe, and then if you're doing something unusual, you can bend the recipe and add extra salt or sugar. That's it for the operations experience. Now I'm shifting into interoperability. The uh, land most of you know as Ensemble or even Health Connect. And our focus there is to make things easy for the interface engineer. By its nature, uh, Ensemble provides a lot of power and you can drop into code whenever you need to. But if you are not a coder, we wanna make it easy for people to hook up interoperability, to test interfaces, and to work very quickly with that as well as orchestrating AI services and working with IoT. So what that looks like specifically this year uh, is a big focus on HL7 in the healthcare space and on general purpose ease of use enhancements. Uh, and then we're already working on auto generation tools that can either use examples or specs and generate productions and generate interfaces in a similar way to API first coding if you're developing. Um, adapters and connectors, I think one thing that we realized is that many of you as customers have built connectors or adapters or change things that we provide with the product and would be willing to share that, but we didn't provide a mechanism. That's what the uh, inner systems open exchange is meant for. So the immediate effect that I'm hoping for is that you'll see some broader choices simply out of the community. Um, but we're specifically aiming at IoT, MQTT adapter, and then beyond that, a much broader set of adapters uh, because there are some new technologies and standards coming out that we're eyeing. So making it easy from a UX and interface engineer standpoint, and then making breadth of connectivity. For the interface engineers, the highlights are a brand new schema editor and DTL editor, uh, a debugger and a new record map thing. These are all in 2019-1, not shipping yet. And then a productivity toolkit specifically for HL7 that we're 
developing and can deliver sort of incrementally independent of release. And if you want to know more about that, there's a session tomorrow called Productivity for Interface Engineers. Anybody in the room on Interface Engineer? Okay, so definitely recommend that. From an interoperability standpoint with um, AI services, I wanted to just give you an example, another example story, uh, which is, I, I thought, a nice use case. This is a uh, real estate management company that focuses on things like uh, oil rigs, plants, et cetera, where the people they sent out for inspection were getting thousands of photographs and just sticking them off in a hard drive someplace. There are now, uh, from Google, Microsoft, and Amazon, actually the five companies spending two billion a year plus on AI. And the, what they call the machine ver vision or cloud vision API is a, specifically for photo recognition. They've taken millions of examples and provided just an API you can call, send it a photograph, and it'll tell you what's in it. It'll tell you the text in it, and it does OCR. Beyond that, actually, in, in this case, it worked fine for OCR, <laughs> images, faces, landmarks, but not for industrial equipment. And there is a facility both in Google and in Microsoft for custom vision services using something called extension learning. So instead of a million examples, you take a million examples of consumer things like puppies on green grass, and you add a thousand examples of industrial equipment, and you actually get as good an effect as, as if you had a million training set samples. It's pretty neat. So simply by using the custom search API and then feeding that to another machine learning thing to do issues, they were able to make a very powerful application using iris interoperability with basically three cloud services and three dips. So when I in this morning talked about people building interesting and powerful applications with interoperability, this is a good example. And frankly, you can do this in Ensemble today. This is not yet specific to Iris. What will make this more specific to Iris is the API management. So overall, this theme of freedom of choice includes building best of breed capabilities within the platform, but then also giving you a choice. And you should expect to see that in a variety of areas. Expect to see that in programming languages, where we love object script, we're maintaining it, we're growing it, but you want to use Java or C Sharp or Node or Python, we'll support that as a first class citizen. We're supplying our own API management, or we will be by the end of the year. But we also know that every major cloud vendor provides API management, and they're all trying to get people to, as part of making their platform sticky, like the old operating system wars. So you may choose to use a different API management package, which means we'll need to keep a list of what are tested interoperability things with. Same thing with machine learning stacks, same thing with management and monitoring tools. And that's another role for this InterSystems Open Exchange. So I'll put in a plug for anyone that wants to contribute to it. Um, and you'll see that it's clear what is InterSystems supplied and supported, what's community supplied and supported. We already have partners that are, have put things into the initial element as a, you know, a, a community edition or a free trial. And that and want to actually upsell to additional licenses commercially. We won't do any commercial transactions. We're never going to charge for things in the exchange. Its purpose is to accelerate development and interoperability along with our technology. OK, so I've talked about the developer view, the operations view, the interoperability view. How about analytics? Well. Analytics has a lot of elements to it. It's a sort 
sort of a broad, almost Rorschach test kind of term. It includes, for us, basic SQL performance. I mean, you heard Carlos talking this morning about very high performance benchmarks on SQL. That is sort of lumped into the analytics area, as well as multi-workload, multi-model, and scalability from a, a straight data, data management standpoint. Analytics also has this quote unquote open analytics strategy where we have built into the platform text analytics. This is, uh, came from an acquisition of Ino. Uh, we have built in BI, which is a successor to DeepSea, and we have standards for a variety of areas. We're now making, we've already built in an Apache Spark connector, and I mentioned this morning that we're building in then self-service BI connectors. So this is a pretty broad landscape where the blue is stuff that, is, that we build and invest in, the red are standards that we maintain and grow, and then the green are I'll say standard high performance integrations. So for say bread and butter data management, we already have a lot of horizontal scaling. Again, this easy elastic growth is a key element there. Data volumes are just growing so fast that scaling up to larger hardware is no longer a viable option. Um, we have added in 2018-2, uh, bitmap, who's using bitmap indexes? Okay, so that's now, is, you can see I'm schizophrenic. This is uh, the difference between software that we're already done with and software you, you, you have in your hands yet. In this year, um, you can do bitmap indexes on any table, very flexibly. And then beyond there, the sharding which we are starting with straight relational models and sharding tables, essentially. We are, are growing out to other models, such as objects and globals. For advanced analytics, this year, uh, I think you can read, talked about BI tools, uh, enhancements across the board to our embedded or native analytics, and then uh, a set of connectors to additional visualization tools, especially scientific visualization, user enhancements, and a, uh, a concept called analytic workflows. So um, I won't talk much more about that because you heard it this morning. Uh, if uh, anybody going to the AI symposium on Wednesday afternoon? Okay, uh, great. So. We'll talk a lot more about accelerating AI then. And there's also uh, uh, a couple of talks about that on Wednesday morning. But what we're focused on is, again, not inventing machine learning algorithms, but making them easy to use, making it easy for you to prepare data for them, build the models quickly with lots of data, and operationalize the model directly in the system. And the, the pattern that you saw and our, our key tool today for Iris is essentially using PMML and building things in Spark in the ML um, stack of your choice. We will do more than that, uh, but we're looking at what are the things that we can do better than anybody else in that space. Um, who came to Andreas's talk just before this? Okay, so fair number, maybe half the room. I won't talk much more about that other than to say, up to this point, remember that a year ago, Iris wasn't on the market. And the first version was early. The summer version was, represents the miles that we have on it. And now we're gearing up to say the water's fine, come on in. We want to make sure it's safe before we sort of ask people to bet their business on it, which is why we've taken that time. 
Um, for the 29.1 release, focus is simplifying the migration and providing these interoperable interoperability ECP and mirroring between Cache, Ensemble, and Iris to allow people to migrate over time, especially if they have complex, very mission critical applications. One more thing I wanted to touch on before I start taking questions is a big change of gears. We're introducing a two release stream model uh, in which the main release streams are, or the normal ones are exactly what you're used to. These are what we'll call extended maintenance releases available with maintenance, with ad hocs, and supported indefinitely and maintained indefinitely. Those are going to be on an annual basis. The feedback I've gotten from talking to customers is your releases are fine, but they're not predictable. Right? If, you, if you could just make them predictable, I don't care if they're you know, every nine months or every year, I just want to be able to plan. So that's, that's a, a big focus. The way that we're getting at that is through a, uh, a, a quicker stream, which are quarterly releases that are container-only releases. We call them CD for continu continuous delivery. So if you want to get access to the latest and greatest, once a quarter, by nature, there'll be smaller changes, so you can have regression test against your application more easily. Um, they allow us to move a lot more quickly and get code to customers quickly. And then every fourth one is identical to the annual release, where the main difference is on these traditional releases will support all supported platforms. Whereas with the CD releases, it's Docker containers only, and therefore the sort of soak time and the work that we put into making sure that things work on all operating systems and all processor models and things like that will focus on the traditional releases. We're starting now. So in October, we'll have a 2018-2 release, which is containers only. And in February, we'll have a 2019-1 release which is a traditional release. So those of you that are sort of gearing up to this, I would say you can play with the 2018-2 release, develop, do development, we'll support it in production. If you're new to containers, take your time and focus on the 2019-1 release. But that is the rhythm that we're using moving forward is quarterly releases. And then if you are focused on these because perhaps you run AIX. AIX doesn't support containers. We're not gonna, that's not an option for you on the quarterly releases. But you can, you can look at these quarterly releases and if you have a question about what's, what's in 2020, if you will, um, three quarters of it is visible to you, already working, already shipped, and it reduces the uncertainty. So if I summarize, there's a big eye chart here, but we cover a lot of ground by nature of being a integrated platform across the audiences that I talked about and then of course system-wide. This year is a lot about the freedom of choice and cloud trends that we talked about this morning. So, We've accelerated API management, growth, client-side languages, and really focused on ingest performances, performance and, and scale out. We're doing, actually there's things in the product today that are pretty powerful for data scientists and machine learning engineers. But this is a year for us to learn in the market a lot about these use cases and where we can do things 
really distinctively and then turn the juice on in a very significant way next year. So that's a, a, a highlight. Um, are there questions? Is anyone still awake? <laughs> At least one person is still awake. I know I covered a lot of ground. Um, come on, there gotta, gotta be questions. Uh, I'm, I'm supposed to encourage you to use the mic, by the way. Um, is that essentially going to be something similar to what we were hoping to see in Enterprise Manager? Or is that kind of capability gonna be there? Because you know, as you've said, you know, when we manage many instances, you got dev, QC, and then you have prod, and prod you have you know, your primaries, your backups, maybe some async reporting servers and that kind of stuff. And we wanna keep you know, the accounts and all these things in sync on there. And that's, as you said, painful today. What, what's the path to kind of alleviate that? Uh, so the first thing I will say is I don't know completely. Okay. And I wanna hear from you guys what the top pain points are. We know that the, well, the, the first step, the things that we're working on right now have to do with deploying and configuring a cluster, right, sharded and mirrored as one thing and being able to deploy that easily, back it up as a consistent image, restore it as a consistent image as an entire system. So that is just one scenario. The next element is to be monitorable and visible in a wide range of existing tools, right? What people have, monitoring tools galore that work cross cluster, cross instance, cross system. And then the thing that you talked about, which is let me really manage across right. all of these things yeah, is- you know, For high availability today, the mirroring is, is wonderful and it keeps the data in sync and yep. everything. but if you are having to manually kind of try to keep all the user accounts and everything in place and you have lots of interfaces and lots of different, you know, applications consuming those interfaces and your data is great, but then you go to fail over and somebody missed some little thing and now you break something because you failed over to the other instance, but you're not quite completely in sync there. And we were really hoping, you know, the enterprise manager would answer yes. that. Right. But. So that, that's good feedback. I can tell you that the, the direction is to have a single place where all the system configuration is kept and therefore okay. can be, uh, you don't have things that are mirrored and things that are not. That is uh, part of working nicely with cloud deployment tools, for example, okay. is to be Absolutely. able to do that. Thank you and I'd love to participate. Uh, okay, any, any other questions? So thank you very much and enjoy the conference.